I'm, this is the title of my talk. And basically, it is something that was also completely new to me uh, before I came to Tübingen. And uh, the approach I'm going to tell you a little bit about in the next uh, half an hour or so uh, was developed by an orthodontist, a very dedicated uh, woman. I always told her, you, are, you should have become a pediatrician rather than a uh, orthodontist because she was such a caring personality and I'm, I'm, it, it's really uh, it's, uh, very heartwarming to see that uh, he is an orthodontist uh, called Hiran who is actually of the same uh, structure uh, and uh, I think without that commitment it would be impossible because I mean this is so different to producing braces what I see is normally your professional task because this really uh, requires dedication to the baby, and you will see that uh, in a minute why. Um, basically, and you are all familiar with that, facial malformations do form a rather diverse spectrum. Uh, Robin or Robin, actually, I prefer the term Robin sequence because it's unusual to include the first name of the person first describing it. It was Pierre Robin, a uh, Parisian stomatologist. But I mean, we also use the second name for other conditions. So, um, so I prefer to say Robin. And um, this is characterized by the trias or sclosoptosis, so the backward movement of the tongue, a small or retropositioned mandible, and upper area obstruction. And uh, this condition may be associated with cranial dysostosis, like Treacher Collins uh, syndrome uh, or Golden Heart syndrome. But also with cranial synostosis like Crouzon or Pfeiffer syndrome. And uh, as already said, the common denominator is the upper ever obstruction and a huge or very significant failure to thrive. Um, so, because these are the main clinical problems, uh, I also think that our treatment actually should focus uh, on these two aspects. And we have two tools for that for the sleep, uh, for the upper ever obstruction, which is particularly severe during sleep, it is a sleep study. And that was probably the luck we had in Tübingen that I happened to meet there this orthodontist and I had this background in sleep medicine. My first research assignment was sudden infant death syndrome as a very young doctor. And that's what brought me actually to London. Uh, my boss simply told me, this guy has left the department, please take over. That was my choice uh, for getting familiarized with uh, uh, sudden infant death syndrome. But it uh, proved how to be very fruitful because it concerns so many various aspects uh, of, of uh, our professional uh, obligations here. And basically, um, so this sleep study is, is really crucial here. And also a very simple tool, we have to monitor weight. And apparently that is not really done in a very systematic way with many of these uh, patients, although it is so easy to, to weigh them in regular intervals and to, to uh, uh, insert their weight data into uh, one of these weight charts. So that you actually notice, for example, with this baby uh, who was born at around on, on, uh, on around the third, uh, the tenth centile, then dropped below the third centile, and with the uh, treatment we started uh, here, he went up to the twenty-fifth uh, and then fiftieth centile. So, and this is what uh, I will tell you later. This is quite symptom, uh, quite normal what we see with these kids. Um, but I would like, before I talk about this uh, uh, approach, which uh, we uh, developed in Tübingen. Uh, what is uh, normal? What is the normal kind of treatment for these uh, babies? And um, if you look into the literature, they all recommend a prone sleep position. And that kind of didn't resonate with me, being a SITS expert, as already mentioned, because I had learned, or we had learned the hard way in this field, that SITS, uh, that, that prone position is quite a strong risk factor uh, for sudden infant death syndrome. I mean, the largest, uh, one of the best studies in this field is a uh, European cohort study uh, across really uh, 14 European countries. And they came up with a odds ratio of 13.9. That's very high um, and a very strong uh, and highly significant risk factor. And that uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, the path mechanism resulting in this or being responsible for this association between sits and prone sleeping should not apply to robust kids. I mean, there are, it's too rare a condition to, to come uh, up with data, but uh, I think it's a kind of risky decision to, to send a baby home on, uh, on with the recommendation uh, of sleeping prone. Um, and the other thing is, we think it is effective, but I guess it's mainly because we 
don't see the respiratory distress these babies have if they're lying on their tummy. You don't see the chest and the paradoxical breathing that much. Um, because if you look in, into the recent literature, uh, they did proper sleep studies. Uh, for example, this uh, study from uh, France here uh, on 18 infants showed that there was absolutely no significant change in uh, the obstructive apnea hypopnea index. So it was not effective in that study and other studies show the same. Uh, a larger study from Finland reported, yes, it was statistically significant um, if the babies were put in, this, in the prone position, but three quarters continue to have an obstructive apnea hypopnea index of more than five, which is in pediatrics normally our treatment threshold. So they still needed treatment after having been placed prone. So that's not an answer, I think. I mean, it may help a little bit, but it's not sufficient to say, and it's dangerous. So it's really not, not a good idea, basically. Um, now, this is something, uh, and this was a patient uh, sent to us from another hospital, this glossopexy and uh, tongue, tongue lip adhesion. And it reminds me of the medieval times, to be honest. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm a bit biased here, but uh, I'm, I have I take a neonatologist's view. We, are, we are, have become pretty big fans of minimum handling. This is not minimum handling. Um, and uh, the babies can't really... Uh, develop uh, sucking and swallowing with this with his tongue not being able to move properly. Um, and if you look at, at the literature, not surprisingly, data on weight gain are rather disappointing. Um, and uh, sleep study data are, are, are very rare, and I will show you in a minute. Um, and uh, in the older studies, there are also quite uh, frightening um, uh, and, and high uh, uh, side effect rates. Uh, wound assistance or uh, scars developing and uh, CV infections in up to one quarter of, of babies. Um, and internationally, I'm most popular is probably this one here, the manipular distraction osteogenesis. This is, was one of our patients from Hanover. Uh, our maxo maxillofacial surgeons also did this um, operation occasionally. But also, again, this is an, an operation that is actually um, Fraud with uh, side effects. And I'll never forget this uh, young guy here, a nine year old boy who was operated on with Robin sequence as in, 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 in the first year of life. And since then, had developed an ankylosis of his uh, temporal mandibular joint and he couldn't close his mouth anymore. And what's that does to a, to a human being, if you can't close your mouth anymore, it's, it's terrible. Uh, he constantly walked with very strange posture because. Uh, it, it, it affects your entire spine if you can't close the mouth. Um, and sorry, I don't want to put too much bias into this, but this is just my experience with other treatments. And um, I come to what, what I was doing in Hanover in a minute. Um, these are the data. Um, I, I entered the PubMed search just a few days ago, entering Roman sequence, mandibular distraction. Um, uh, and there were 250 hits, and then I added polysomnography, there were only 37, so one, almost one-tenth of the size. I mean, how can you do an operation without proving objectively that it is effective? Um, very strange. Um, but if you add then um, a comparison with TLA, this is, this is the other predominant operative uh, procedure for these babies, you come up with these three studies uh, listed here, or summarized here. And what you can see, at least the MDO is effective, the obstructive apnea hypnea index drops down from 34 to 1 in this study, or from 47 to 2 or 2.6 in this study, and from 38 to 5.7. But TLA is much less effective. I mean, in this study, it did, it did the job, but uh, in the other studies, it really uh, was associated with a still rather unacceptably high mixed obstructive apnea hypnea index. And this is basically how our craniofacial surgeon treated this uh, in Hanover, where I trained, as uh, Jochen mentioned. And um, this is uh, mandibular traction. You put a wire uh, around the mandible, and you put a, a weight onto it, and then you constantly pull. And the baby is forced to be immobilized by pain, because obviously it's, it's a very painful procedure. As soon as he moves, uh, it, it, it hurts. Um, and there are very, very few studies on this uh, intervention, although it is still widely used in several countries around the world. And the largest study is from an Italian center. 
they planted to uh, about one half of their 246, also the large, large center, Rubang uh, children. Um, and they say that uh, saturation normalized. But if you look at their, at their data, I mean, this is the, the data taken from this figure, uh, this figure from the, taken from their paper. And uh, before the intervention, their median saturation was uh, in the low 70s. I mean, I can't believe that this uh, was is true because you can't have a saturation constantly around 70%, but that's what they write in the paper. So I'm not sure who, who has reviewed that paper, but uh, he, this person can't have done a, a proper job really. Um, but anyway, they say it's normalizing, but uh, no, no sleep, it was just pass oximetry, no, no sleep study results. Then the nasopharyngeal airway, that's very popular in, in the UK. Uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital in London uh, has uh, a lot of uh, patients uh, treated with this uh, intervention. And it's basically, uh, uh, you, you just uh, take an ET tube and you position it that it just ends a month the epiglottis and you cut it uh, close to the nose. The position must be checked frequently because a few millimeters can actually uh, either mean that you are aspirating or it can mean that the treatment is not effective anymore. Uh, the British group reported that their uh, weight uh, centers improved uh, significantly, but they provided, uh, unfortunately, no sleep data. Um, and the other critique I have although I, I, we also use this occasionally as a bridging therapy, uh, does not provide any incentive on the mandible to grow because it's not addressing the functional problem of, of uh, Robin sequence, the uh, lack of to be able to swallow and, and suck. Um, this is the, from, taken from, this, from the Great Ormond Street Hospital publication. Uh, they uh, developed an adapter to, to make it easier to fixate, uh, the, uh, to keep the, the, the airway in place, um, so it is uh, not as invasive as many other treatments. And uh, I mean, it's, it's funny to see how it differs by country. The French, particularly in France, but also in Lyon or in Nantes, um, use uh, CPAP. Um, that's also a bridging therapy, no question about that. Um, the French people, colleagues have reported a small case series in pediatrics uh, 10 years ago. Um, and basically report that the time with uh, desaturation was uh, significantly reduced from 14 to 1%. And CO2 measured through the skin uh, was also uh, improving significantly from 57 to 31 millions of mercury. Um, but my main concern with this treatment is that uh, you may actually uh, worsen the already pre-existing maxillary hypoplasia. And that's also something I learned from my colleagues in orthodontics in, in Tübingen, uh, that Aubin sequence babies do not only have a small jaw, but also a small maxilla. You don't see it because the mandible is so much smaller, uh, but it's definitely there. And that's also obstructing the airway inside. You don't see it inside the skull. Um, and it was Christian Guimineau from this uh, sleep center here, the Stanford Sleep Center, one of the godfathers of sleep medicine, who published this uh, uh, paper here showing how what a severe rate of intrusion and maxillary hypoplasia you can develop if you uh, wear this CPAP device for a long time. And this was in a toddler, but here we are talking about infants where the structures are much more modifiable by constant pressure. So I, I, and, and if I look at the baby, I mean, parents won't like it to have their baby uh, constantly um, wrapped into these, this device uh, uh, day and night. Um, Brachiostomy is obviously the ultimate uh, uh, option. Um, and I'm, as, a, as somebody coming from Europe, I'm always surprised uh, how quickly you are, sorry for saying this, in, in this country with making this decision. Um, in a questionnaire study in, the, in US uh, uh, centers for craniofacial malformations, uh, half of respondents consider tracheostomy the treatment of choice as soon as prone position had failed. And given the disappointing effectiveness of the prone position mentioned earlier, that means you end up with high numbers of tracheostomies. But this is not a harmless procedure. It's fraught with a 2 or 3% mortality. It is very costly. Uh, another US study has, has uh, estimated that the cost amount to $90,000 per patient. Um, so it's, it's an ultimate choice. Before the baby dies, it's obviously necessary. I'm, I'm not questioning that. 
but uh, I think it should really be the last reserve rather than uh, something you consider as soon as Trump position has failed. Right, and now I come to punitive plates. And this is uh, actually a uh, publication that's rather old uh, from 1967 um, from Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, this doctor uh, used an, an obturator, a punitive plate, I would call it these days, that had a kind of elongation, a slight elongation that kind of helped perhaps to move the tongue into the correct position. Um, but this report, uh, although published in the Archives of Disease and Childhood, which is quite an influential journal, received very little attention. Uh, and I must admit, I came across it only by chance, really. Um, um, but uh, our orthodontist in Tübingen had uh, also read this paper um, and uh, thought that perhaps uh, the extension here you see uh, on the slide here should perhaps be a little bit longer, ending just uh, above the epiglottis. And, and that's basically her trick, if I may say so. Um, that was her invention to uh, the important addition. And she inserted a metal wire to make sure that the, it doesn't, the, the spur doesn't, doesn't break because the, uh, the forces acting on the spur actually can be quite, quite high. So this is something you need, need to make sure that your uh, device doesn't, doesn't break. But with that uh, wire inside, it, it doesn't break. And that's how it looks uh, in situ, so to speak. Uh, in this drawing, uh, the tongue is automatically moved from its upright position, which is uh, the definition of glossoptosis, to a more normal position shown here. And uh, that will also allow for, uh, the baby to learn how to suck and swallow. But it's really a functional treatment. And I need to stress that it's not enough to just order one of these plates but it is absolutely important to combine it with functional treatment. Um, we always do uh, um, orofacial stimulation, uh, according to Castillo Morales, an, uh, an orthodont uh, physiotherapist from Argen Argentina. Um, and uh, our, our team has uh, learned quite well how, how to apply this. And this is what you see if you endoscope the babies. And, um, and this may be frightening to you, but in, in my center, it's absolutely normal that the neonatologist is doing the endoscopy, um, which in practical terms helps a great deal because you don't have to wait for an ENT specialist. You do it at the bedside. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, if, uh, Occasionally, we have to invite the ENT specialist, and I know what I'm talking about. Wait. Uh, it always takes a few days. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. It's only a prominent tubing. I accept that. Um, but you see immediately that this is the blue structure here is the spur ending just above the epiglottis. It's immediately opening the airway. And um, I will illustrate this uh, with this, uh, with this uh, series of short uh, videos. If you look at this little guy, he has severe dyspnea uh, because of this uh, upper airway obstruction, the um, Obong sequence phenotype. Uh, obviously, he has a gastro nasogastric tube. And you see how much difficulty he has uh, breathing. And then you put the baby on the, on the tummy, on the, on the prone position, sorry. Um, and um, the baby still has the problem. You don't see it as much as before. You don't see the retractions anymore. But the problem, as I already said, is still there. And then you insert the plate. The baby goes to sleep immediately because he suddenly can breathe easily and freely, and you don't hear a, a sound. And this is just a subjective impression. I don't want to uh, bias you too much. Uh, this is German introducing uh, the plate, uh, also another uh, rather old video. Um, this is basically how we do it. Um, and it, it, it's done in, in, in less than a minute. And um, it doesn't seem too unpleasant. I mean, you sometimes wonder whether they are actually, why don't they uh, start to retch? Um, but because it's not touching the backside of your throat, but only the, the, the ventral side of it, it, it doesn't result in retching. And then we do the endoscopy to check whether it's, uh, if it's a new plate, and that's what, what we have filmed here, whether, whether that's, uh, the spur ends just above the epiglottis. You need this endoscopy to make sure that you're not damaging the structures, which are very sensible there in the, in the, uh, in the, in the pharynx. 
And this is basically our timeline. We, ad uh, we admit the baby. Nowadays, we do uh, a scan. We do have a developed a fully digital workflow where we produce a, a scan rather than an impression taken. And uh, then we produce the first prototype, uh, still without the metal wire inside. Um, and then we insert it and do an endoscopy and check whether it's uh, fitting all right. And as soon as we think, yes, it's fitting all right, and the angulation of the spur is also okay, pushing the base of the tongue sufficiently forward to open the airway, but not too much, because otherwise pressure marks would, uh, would develop. Then we do a sleep study uh, to see whether it's effective. And if we still have the feeling it's, it can be improved, we, we modify the plate. We have to repeat the sleep study occasionally, and we have to uh, repeat the endoscopy occasionally. But that's basically how it is. And our median duration of hospital stay is um, 16 days uh, across uh, 300 babies, so a really large cohort. Sleep studies, as I mentioned, as I already mentioned, are really important, and that's what you see. The nasal flow is again and again interrupted, whereas the baby continues to make breathing efforts. The saturation fluctuates, but we can have severe upper airway obstruction, unfortunately, without the pulse oximeter showing it. So you can't be sure that you have frequent desaturation, uh, but you still have significant upper airway obstruction. That's why I'm absolutely convinced, and I mean, I, my main subject for many years, research subject was pulse oximetry. So I'm a big fan of pulse oximetry. But uh, for this condition, it is not sensitive enough. You will miss a, quite a significant proportion of patients if you are just doing a pulse oximetry. You will obviously identify the tip of the iceberg, but the iceberg underneath the water is, is quite large. And uh, I'm not sure whether any sleep specialists are here in the audience or in the, in the online uh, forum. Um, we have been criticized that we are always doing the mixed obstructive apnea index and not the hypopnea index. Um, and we recently uh, did a study to, to see the difference between the two parameters. And basically, yes, uh, the mixed obstructive apnea hypopnea index results in almost twice the, uh, the index. So they are twice as common as the uh, apneas only. Um, but basically, uh, if you keep that in mind, and perhaps use a different treatment threshold. We have a treatment threshold of three for many years, and compared to the conventional threshold of five, so you end up with the five that's in place otherwise if you include the hypopneas. And the reason why we ignored them, because we don't do full polysomnography. Although I'm a sleep specialist, and I, I know how to read a, a sleep study with the EEG, I see these babies are so compromised by their upper air obstruction that any additional procedure to them, they don't tolerate. And because it's not giving me really important additional information, because I'm not after neurological uh, problems or seizure-induced uh, apneas or something like that, but I know what the pathophysiology here is, I think the addition of the full P, uh, PSG can be omitted. And that's why we, are, we have decided to do that for, for the last 20 years. And then after these uh, two weeks or a few days more, we talk to the parents and to make sure that they have learned how to insert, remove, and clean the, the plate. They must be removed once daily to check the mucosa um, for any uh, pressure marks. Um, we do a sleep study in the supine position. And here, the mixed obstructive apnea index should be below three. And then we send the baby home on a parts oximeter, simply because parents need to become aware if the plate uh, is dislodged and baby develop after air obstruction that, that doesn't happen in the middle of the night and the parents don't notice that. And that's again one of these uh, weight charts. You see how much uh, they approved their weight. Um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a plate in, inside. And um, also um, for, for scientific evaluations, we calculate the Z score uh, on, on, on weight. So the one Z is one standard deviation below or above the mean. And for example, in this study, where we did a national survey to see how robotic sequence is treated in, in my country, in Germany. Um, and was, I was kind of in, interested to see that out of 138 infants reported, sorry, um, uh, 51 had been treated with the, uh, at that uh, at the time, we called it the pre obstructive beta plate. Now, as you call it, the tubing implanted plate, it's the same. And that's not only our center. So it's, it, is, it is being used by at least nine other centers in Germany that I'm aware of, maybe more these days. 
So it's nothing very special. And, and I, I must admit that none of these other eight centers has come to Tübingen to learn how to do it. So um, anyway, that's how it is. Um, but what I want to say is that infants who uh, had severe phenotype that needed uh, emergency interventions for their breathing problems were also those which had a much lower Z score. So uh, their weight gain was much more problematic than in the, uh, in the infants without emergency interventions. And also to monitor treatment effectiveness. For example, here we compared our weight data with the, the other centers' weight data, and the difference between admission to hospital and discharge was zero. Basically, the infants had stayed in their center they had at the time they were admitted, whereas in the other centers, they had lost three quarters of the standard deviation of their weight, which is quite a, a high number, really, given that we are talking about two or three weeks of hospital stay. And also on a larger scale, for example, here we analyzed uh, uh, data from 307 infants data with uh, isolated Roubaix sequence over a 20 year period, non needing tracheostomy. Um, and basically, we are also not doing a really good job because the babies are already admitted with a, a negative Z score. So they have already lost some weight uh, between being born and being admitted to, to our center. So uh, if more than one standard deviation um, and we don't fully uh, manage to get uh, catch up right but by the time they reach one year of age they have half their delay in, in, in growth so it's getting better but not fully normal within the first year feeding is a major issue as i said it's a functional treatment and you need to combine this plate with this functional treatment and I'm, I'm i must admit here our nurses are really doing a good job we do have, as I already said, physiotherapists or speech therapists to help them and also particularly to train the parents. But uh, the nurses, because they are there day and night and the speech therapist is there only five times a week for half an hour, um, it's, it's not the same. And we use uh, these Playtex bottles, which are squeezable bottles produced here in the United States. So we import them because you can't get them on the German market via, via Amazon, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's uh, it's really helpful because uh, that for with these bottles, bottles it's, it's much easier to control the milk flow, uh, flow because otherwise with normal heat uh, I sometimes uh, have the impression that it's almost like waterboarding. Um, it's not a good uh, practice. Uh, and uh, this is just another example of how it looks in reality. Um, <laughs> Should I should actually the sound is he's doing a great job there. But it is a procedure that requires patience on this both the baby actually and the caregiver. Um, because in utero they have learned it the wrong way. I mean you know that babies are also fetuses are also swallowing uh, 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 but it is, um, they have to learn it because in, in utero their tongue is totally in the wrong position. But they do. I mean, 90% of our babies are fully orally fed, uh, not by a tube, by uh, the time they go home after weeks. So, after having shown you this treatment, how it works, I just want to uh, address a few um, questions. First, is it this played more effective than a sham procedure. So we did the randomized controlled trial. I mean, I'm a neonatologist. So I was, I'm used to the value of randomized controlled trials. So I wanted to have this also here because there was, there still is, except for the one I'll show you in a minute, no randomized trial at all for, for any intervention for this condition. And then we wanted to know whether it's also effective in severe phenotypes because at conferences I was always being told by the colleagues from ENT, uh, from uh, maxillofacial surgery. Yes, this works in the mild phenotypes you see in Tübingen, but our patients are much worse. They can't be managed. Uh, so I come to that in a minute. Uh, then the important question is there mandibular catch-up growth, and then is it only feasible in Tübingen or also elsewhere? Now, with regard to this controlled trial, we did a sham procedure. We just inserted a plate without the extension. We, for ethical reasons, we felt we could only do that for two days. So we did a repeat sleep study uh, after the one done at admission and uh, in, in both uh, 
after both interventions, and basically they focused again on the mix of obstructive apnea index and found, found that this had actually decreased from 14 to 4 within these 48 hours in the, uh, with the tubing implanted plate and had stayed in the same range of, at around 15 uh, with the conventional pilot to plate. And also the saturation index uh, had significantly improved, but not significantly so with the uh, sham procedure. And we did an extension to this study uh, time-wise, and the mix of toxic apnea index then moved down to one after, uh, I think, two weeks. And the CO2 normalized, and the weight gain was also improved. And with regard to um, effectiveness in severe phenotypes, we looked at a, a sample of 122 infants with Robin sequence. Um, and we divide them into three groups depending on their uh, mixed obstructive apnea index at admission. And we had the most severe group here with a mean index of 30. And mind you, this would uh, correspond to an index of 60. Uh, with your sleep studies here doing full polysonography, that's quite a high. Uh, value, 60 obstructive events per, per hour, one every minute, and that normalized to 0.2 at the three months follow-up in the same range as in the other two groups. So it, it doesn't really matter how severe the phenotype is uh, with isolated infants. And for syndromic ones, that is a, a kind of a different kettle of fish, if I may say so. Some are really problematic. Um, and sometimes we have to use modifications where we attach a tube a tubular structure to the to the spur, or uh, uh, even do a kind of uh, airway plate, uh, or, or this one here. So there, the orthodontist has to become really uh, very innovative. Um, but uh, with that approach, we looked at uh, or analyzed data from 68 uh, consecutive patients and uh, 56 complete treatment. Uh, Three, we had to tracheostomize. So that's in this particular group that may also happen. So it's not a perfect treatment. There are, uh, there are failures, clearly. And also very important, the main group of, of diagnosis that's not compatible with the plate treatment is are babies with swallowing, severe swallowing disorders and a, a lot of saliva production. Because it will initially, particularly initially, it increases certain incentive that uh, saliva production increases. And um, that's, for example, the case in, in charge association uh, babies who also have quite often an evil hypoplasia. So they would benefit from such a plate, but they don't tolerate it because they can't swallow. Uh, and Wiedemann Beckwith, those with a larger tongue, uh, are, have also difficulties coping with the plate. And what we do in this, uh, with this diagnosis, we give it a try. You never know in advance, um, but only for a few days. And then we see, is there an effect or is the baby not coping with it? And then we uh, switch over to other treatments. And uh, altogether with these 68 patients, the mixed obstructive apnea index also decreased into the range shown for the isolated cases. So it's equally effective, but there are exceptions. Treatment failures is a better word. Um, the question now is, um, sorry, does it also work elsewhere? And to address that, we um, collaborated with two other centers in Cologne and Würzburg and other two uh, German cities. And uh, we also, we also had uh, introduced this treatment before we contacted them. We, so we knew that they had experience with that. And we asked them to feed their data prospectively into a, a database. And basically, the uh, decrease in the mix of structural apnea index was very similar to the data just from Tübingen uh, shown earlier. So it can also be done elsewhere. And uh, the prime example here is uh, uh, our colleague here, Hiran Chu, uh, who actually uh, developed this treatment or introduced this treatment, as already said here, to Stanford without having uh, come to tubing in to see how it works, just from reading our papers very carefully. Congratulations that you really achieved uh, this and, and you, you published data on that. And then your sleep study data also very impressive. So it is equally uh, effective here. And it is. Uh, back home, um, and uh, the advantage you had uh, that in at least these two patients you published in the cleft palate craniofacial journal, you could do CTs so that you can actually could demonstrate how the bones actually uh, um, grow. 
the, the, the catch-up growth. Um, we had to use uh, non-invasive approaches to monitor catch-up growth. There is a publication on the so-called JAW index, a uh, publication from the Netherlands, where you can actually monitor mandibular growth non-invasively with a measuring tape. Um, and basically found that the uh, jaw index had uh, improved significantly in these babies. But uh, although this paper has been published, uh, I must criticize it myself. These measurements were done uh, not blinded to the condition of the baby. So we kind of repeated this study in a slightly larger sample and uh, prospectively. Um, we recruited 19 consecutive Robang infants and 31 controls. And we did 3D uh, photography, and we uh, used uh, measuring points uh, on advice from the um, colleagues in orthodontics. And uh, you see how, how over time, uh, the, sorry, the data uh, from uh, the uh, normal infants uh, became similar to the ones from the Robang uh, infants. So basically, although they haven't become fully identical after the uh, uh, six months period where we monitored that, they have become very similar already. Um, so it, it is definitely uh, uh, inducing a catch up growth. And this is uh, the logo from, from a meeting we had uh, that was actually based on a father doing a side view of his baby with Robang sequence every two weeks. So I can't, we could basically choose which ones were the, the, the most helpful. And you can see immediately how the mandible has actually grown forward, um, resulting in a totally normal facial profile after uh, nine months. But that's a one-off case, so the scientific evaluation, I think, is much more uh, important here. And as I already said, we are moving to uh, a digital uh, procedure. We are scanning now, and rather than imp impression taking, and we use 3D printers. And we have very active uh, colleagues uh, in the a group for biomedical engineering. And we are now measuring this person to, to derive at a catalog that can help other centers to know what dimensions they have to uh, attain in their, in their patients. Um, and, but that's the future, and I won't talk about that. And it's what quite interesting to see is, uh, just last two weeks ago, uh, a center from Bratislava in uh, Slovak Republic uh, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, published this uh, case study where they also do, did uh, CT scans, uh, how the plate uh, was actually fitting into the anatomy uh, on, the, on the CT picture. I don't have this because it, for ethical reasons we don't do CTs, but uh, it's always interesting to see. Uh, and, and this is also a sort of modification that they don't use the metal wires to keep the plate in place, but had this uh, 3D printed uh, extension here configured. But that's good or no or not, I, I can't comment on. So I'm at the end of my presentation. I have tried to convince you that severe obstructive sleep apnea and failure to thrive are the main clinical problems in Roma sequence. That the plate I presented to you is effective in almost all emphasis isolated Roma and uh, in more than 80% of those with syndromic Roma. It may help to avoid more invasive or purely bridging treatment options like tracheostomy or CPAP. Um, its effectiveness must be monitored through sleep studies and weight monitoring. Uh, and we are currently in the process of setting up a register, or we have already set it up. Um, and uh, we have already uh, in a collaboration agreement with the uh, center in um, Harvard. And they also feed their data. They are big fans of mandibular distraction. So that we have a control of mandibular distraction because you can't do randomized controlled trials with different treatment approaches here, but uh, at least some registry data will tell you a little bit more how well the outcome is uh, comparable between one intervention or another. And with that, I would like to leave you uh, and uh, would be absolutely happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. It's really uh, groundbreaking and uh, very excited about it. Are there any questions in the audience or on, on Zoom? I just wanted to bring uh, Dr. Chu here so everybody kind of can see her and knows who she is. If you see her walking around the hospital, you may not, may not know. Um, she'll, she'll be handling the, the, the questions on Zoom.
Very good point. Uh, so we'll have to repeat the question. Yes, how long do we keep the place in place? Um, and that's basically for four, three to four months. Um, so if the baby comes in new as a neonate, it's the treatment is usually done with uh, by four months. I'm not sure how you do it here in Stanford, but that's that's our experience. Very similar between about uh, six, uh, three to six months. Like on average, I would say about four to five. And it's interesting, the younger the baby uh, is admitted, the sooner the treatment is over. That's so true. Uh, so the growth potential is probably larger than the neonatal age. And it's good to, to, I mean, ideally, but unfortunately, I'm not sure how it is in this country, the prenatal ultrasound experts are not that good. Only 16% of our uh, infants with Robin are identified prenatally. And only 11% are actually referred antenatally and then giving birth in our center, which would be the ideal because it doesn't put the infant at any risk. Um, but uh, as I said, the detection rate is not uh, very satisfying here. We have actually uh, five questions from our uh, online audience. And then I'll, I will read the first question is, what is the effect on breastfeeding with these appliances? And how many years is the duration of the therapy typically? But it's not years, usually months. And uh, uh, how often do the devices need to be upsized? Yes, also very, very good questions. Um, yes, breastfeeding is possible. You, if you are working in this uh, area, you know that uh, breastfeeding success rates are not very high in infants with cleft. Uh, partly because mothers are quite stressed, which doesn't improve the milk flow, uh, but also partly because it's not that pleasant a feeling uh, with, the, with, the, with the nipple and, and the plate. Um, so uh, in some babies, we, we just do a breastfeeding uh, uh, exercise when the plate is being taken out for, for cleaning. Um, uh, so yes, we have put a lot of weight on that. And uh, uh, nowadays, about half the babies are going home breastfed. But that's only half because normally we're at 80 percent so there we can still improve um but we are working on it and uh, one of our specialists in this field from the neonatal side is also a, a certified uh, lactation con consultant so she is doing a great job with uh, basically encouraging the, the parents not to give up really and the other question was how long and how often uh, do you need to upsize the yes um normally uh, the first Larger plate is needed after six to uh, eight weeks. Um, but normally, actually, the second plate is the last plate. Um, so, the, as I said, the growth potential is larger than the, the neonatal age. So, it's pretty normal after uh, six to eight months, uh, weeks that they have to come back for, for a larger plate. But uh, then, uh, until the uh, mandible has moved sufficiently forward that we don't need the, uh, the plate anymore. That's, uh, so we rarely need the third plate, but it, it does happen occasionally. Um, just to let you know, at Stanford, we kind of see the baby monthly basis just to make sure the growth is not restricted. And then quite often, a very minimal adjustment, but definitely we increase the, especially the um, palatal component of the device. So second question is, uh, do you use three 3D printers for rapid prototyping for the device. Yes, um, we do that. And uh, as I said, that's where I think the future is also. Yeah. Um, but um, that's a, such a complicated process and our technicians are really excellent in, in doing that. They are actually biomedical engineers, not just technicians. Um, and that's beyond my uh, core competence. So I, I better leave that to them. But the answer is clearly yes. The only these days, the last imprint we took was about a year and a half ago. So we are not doing imprints anymore. It's all scanning. It works very well. So it's start much... with the intraoral scanning and then directly to the 3D printing. Okay. Um, the next question is, are you aware of any centers in low and middle income countries using this device? Yeah, very good question because it's ideal for that kind of setting. Um, although ideal is perhaps not the best word here. Um, but if anything works uh, in this kind of setting, it's, it's most likely to be this one um, because it's comparatively easy. And I, I'm aware of uh, colleagues in India having introduced this and in, uh, in China. I mean, China is not a third world country. I should be careful here. Um, but in India, definitely. And we have one colleague from um, Mumbai 
will actually come over for three months, uh, starting uh, about after Christmas. So he will learn how to do, do the, the, the print up and the, the whole setup. And uh, so we hope to it will catch up also in, in countries like India. Wonderful. I mean, it, at, at Stanford, I'm having a lot of difficulties with the IRB before starting any of this process. But I think definitely agree this is the future. Um, Another question is, Are you? Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. I'm curious if you have considered this therapy in babies slightly older than six months. Well, the problem is with tooth eruption. Um, if there are tooth eruptions, because this is basically the plate is uh, also covering the, uh, um, uh, the uh, what's the word? Um, alveolar ridges. Alveolar ridge, yeah. um, uh, it doesn't really work. Uh, you have to modify the plate too often yes. uh, if, if, the, if it's in the process of this tooth eruption. So we ideally make sure that we are, have one more, that we more, more or less done before the teeth uh, start to erupt. Yeah, and also by that age, they, the babies become like exponentially active and they're going to pull things and they're not going to be very cooperative. So that's why, and also their growth spurt kind of plateaus a little bit from the age six months toward. So it, it, within the six months, I think this is the prime time to start this treatment. Yeah. Um, next question is, uh, do changes to the spur with help with the swallowing? So I guess uh, adjusting the, you know, the tail portion, would it help yes. swallowing? Yes, I mean, we occasionally have, the main problem is not to be too aggressive. So it's better to have uh, inclination of the spur you know the upper obstruction won't be resolved, but the baby has then more time to get used to it and still swallow nicely and become a little bit more ambitious after a few days and then move the spur a little bit forward. Um, although you have to produce a new plate, but I mean, the production cost, I mean, this costs $10. Uh, it's not, uh, it's nothing because but this is 3D printing. It's, it has become really cheap. Um, so yes, then we do a new uh, plate with a different angulation of the spur. Yeah, yeah. I mean, neonatal, you know, air digestive, the study itself is very, very complex and really complicated to study. And we're dealing with this dynamic, very dynamic movement. So it's, but bottom line is be, be, to improve baby swallowing, actually ha even improve or it, like make it happen. The very first thing we need to control is having a very competent breathing. Once the breathing is, is resolved, then we can actually rule out is the breathing is the true source of this uh, dysphagia or, you know, the baby has a different situation in addition to the breathing. So I think that's a big first step to clear out, to investigate what's the root cause to the uh, dysphagia. So the last question today is that fascinating data. Do you have an explanation for why mandibular hypoplasia results from this intervention? Yes, it, it gives a growth incentive and particularly because the function is normalized. The function, there's a paradigm in your, in your specialty, orthodontics, form follows function. So if the function is normalized, the form will normalize that's also. It. And that's a proof that this paradigm is actually a true one. Um, yep. And that's, I mean, I, I was looking for the, for the data. I mean, in these 307 infants, after three months, none of them had a feeding tube anymore. So they all can grow normally without a feeding tube. Yeah. Perhaps not always within the two-week time they stay in our unit, but within two or three months, definitely every baby will, will be fully orally fed. That's really fantastic. Amazing. Maybe finish with one last question, which I find intriguing regarding the patient population of the trisomy 21 babies, which have a lot of obstructive sleep apnea, and uh, just your general thoughts on what might be possible for them. Yes, uh, thanks for raising this question. Um, we have a program where we do uh, routine sleep studies at six weeks of age in all of these babies with, uh, with Down syndrome. and. Uh, we identify quite a high proportion, uh, one third already have significant upper airway obstruction at that age. And uh, we do start with a plate, although they don't have a cleft, but the, the, the plate with a stimulation knob and without the spur. The stimulation knob, again, this functional treatment. 
um, and their publications from the 1970s in Germany, that was not our invention. That's really uh, an old technique that the stimulation knob will have the, will have the tongue to, to assume it's like bodybuilding for the tongue because this has this muscular hypotonia and with this uh, stimulation knob, the, the tongue is constantly moved forward to the uh, front teeth and that will prevent the mouth from staying open as so often the case in uh, uh, Down syndrome infants otherwise. And if they have a high mix of structure apnea index, then they also may get a palatal plate with a, with a spur. So about 10% of our Down syndrome kids are also getting a, a, a tubing and palatal plate, although they don't, they don't have a cleft, which is much more tricky because there's less space in the, in the pharynx. But uh, if there's, I mean, the alternative is CPAP, uh, which uh, is also not a good idea in uh, Down syndrome because they also have this um, maxillary hyperplasia, so which will, may get worsened by, by, the, uh, by the CPAP. Uh, mask. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful talk and for sharing your expertise. And, uh... My pleasure. Thanks for having me. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.